Good evening and welcome to the show. This is Drinking Digital, the first and only weekly podcast here in the Philippines about digital communications. Tonight promises to be a momentous episode. First of all, it is Friday the 13th and this is, believe it or not, the 13th episode of Drinking Digital. So if this whole place caves in, you know what to blame. I don't know why people still subscribe to that in the age of digital. People still don't have 13th floors and they panic every time it's Friday the 13th. Anyway, we, pro- we did promise a momentous, okay, a, a momentous episode. Tonight we have a very important guest. I will not, um, I will not uh, talk about the credentials and because our one hour show might run out if I go through all the accolades and all the awards and all the accomplishments of our guests. So without uh, further ado, I introduce our guest for tonight, Ms. Maria Ressa. Maria, thank you for accommodating our invitation to guest here in the show. Thanks for having me, Ricky. (laughs) Okay, and tonight, we will talk about Maria's digital journey and her new online endeavor, which we will reveal in a moment. So Maria, tell us, uh, what brought you to what you are doing now? Uh, about a year ago. Well, okay. you know, I've spent more than 25 years as a TV journalist. That's right. Um, started in Probe, and then I, while we were doing Probe, I moved to CNN, and then CNN for almost 20 years. And then six years with ABS. That's right. Um, so each one, I felt that I just kept learning more and more. By the time I finished CNN, I knew what it was like to report. So I, f- I figured I, I got the skills and I wanted to do more. So I moved up, mm-hmm. tried to look at what can we do with media? You know, what, what is its purpose? How can we affect society with mm-hmm. it? Deal with bigger issues. And it was loads of fun. You can think strategically about mm-hmm. how can you converge the different types of media to actually help make society better. Then all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, this wor- our world is changing. And the internet is like a, a, a tsunami that's mm-hmm. going to throw what we used to know, really throw it out exactly. the window. And that's happening now. The ground is shifting underneath our feet. So about a year ago, I started to think, you know, I, I think I want to do something more. Okay. Um, there's, there's something I'm not doing that I should be doing. Okay. And so that was the epiphany for you. Yes. You know, I couldn't do what I wanted to do inside the constraints of a traditional media organization. All right. And what was the final, uh, what was the final event that really pushed you that I can do this on my own and I need to adapt to whatever's happening in the world? I think my love of journalism. Okay. You know, uh, and you wanted to be able to uh, communicate that as freely as you wanted to. At the beginning, um, you have, gosh, a year, a, more than, a little more than a year ago, at the tail end of ABS-CBN, I was very unhappy with the fact that I wasn't doing any real journalism. Okay. I wasn't doing reporting the way I wanted to. I was, I was caught in, in a, 90% of my work was, was caught in a bureaucracy. Okay. And so I thought, it's time to, to really go back to journalism. So I took a year off to write a book. Okay, and strangely yes, right. enough, this book led me right back to journalism and social networks, okay. which was the basis, really, of what the internet does. Mm-hmm. You know, it connects all of us. So um, in that year, the evolution of ideas grew out of, well, I'll give you the title of my book is From Bin Laden to Facebook. That's right. It's actually tracing the growth of terrorism through social networks. Mm-hmm. Those very same ideas you can use to trace the growth of social media Mm -hmm. and how you can try to harness social media. So it was an evolution over over a period of time where I thought, oh my gosh, we can harness this, we can harness what's going on in the internet and social media, and we can harness it for nation building. Mm -hmm. It sounded really huge when we first started talking about it, and then as the ideas kept coming, it became more and more real, and then it became tactical and implementable. Okay, and then from from that point, what happened from there to your new baby now, Rappler? This is the culmination of a lot of those Tell things. Tell us about how everything fell into place. Um, again, from terrorism, right? One of the things you realize, there was a, 
uh, studies that were published by two Harvard professors beginning in 2007 that looked at how people spread. They spread ideas, yes, but beyond ideas, what really spreads like wildfire across physical social networks are emotions. Okay. And these two Harvard professors said that uh, any group of people will spread an emotion through three degrees of influence. Any emotion. So, for example, if I'm feeling lonely, mm -hmm. you, my friend, will have a 54% chance of feeling lonely because I do. Okay. My friend's friend will have a 25% chance of feeling lonely, and my friend's friend's friend, the third degree, will have a 15% chance of feeling lonely. Emotions. Behavior spreads through social networks, through three degrees of influence. If you smoke, if you, um, if you drink, mm -hmm. all of these things have been proven in, in academic papers to have spread through three degrees of influence in social networks. I use that study to look at the spread of terrorism, which is a complex mix of emotions. Mm -hmm. And then when I was doing that research, I thought, oh gosh, let's put this together with news. Because in the end, 80% of the way people make decisions are influenced by their emotions. And it spreads like wildfire through social networks. Okay. So this is, this is why what Rappler has done is really the name of the group we've come up with is Rappler. We couldn't think, we figured it's a new group, it's a new name, it's a new concept, let's create a word. Rappler comes from the word rap to mm -hmm. discuss okay. plus ripple to okay. make waves. All right. And that's what we wanted to do. It's that contagion effect that comes from social networks. Ah, the one last point which makes me which convinced me that it spreads through the the virtual world is in 2009 when I was working on the social network this actually the citizen journalism program of ABS-CBN. Mm -hmm. I took the ideas of these two Harvard professors and threw them into this program. Mm -hmm. And every month we monitored the impact of it. At the end of one year, I had statistics and data that proved to me that what the Harvard professor said happens in the physical world, mm -hmm. happens in the virtual world. And if you were to actually put it as a media campaign, it's wonderful. It okay. can really change behavior. So fast forward to where we are now, mm -hmm. a year later, Rappler gives you traditional journalism, uh, the discipline of traditional journalism. Okay. All, most of us who, have, who are behind it, have, like, we're old. <laughs> um, we know how to do traditional journalism, but it's also combined with this mood meter when you go on the site. It's, mm -hmm. I think, the first globally where you, know, you actually, you can read, watch, play with the story, and then tell us how you feel. That tell us how you feel takes you into the new world mm -hmm. because it not only makes you think about how you feel, and if you think about how you feel, you're automatically more rational. Something, again, from a neuroscientist have said that the very act of labeling your emotions makes you more rational. Mm -hmm. You can listen to the ideas more. Okay. Um, that act, that simple act of, again, clicking the mood meter is aggregated every day into something we're calling a mood navigator. Okay. And it's a, a daily snapshot of the stories that move the world of Filipinos. Okay, and that affects your content, what, what, uh, what you feel the audience wants to listen to or, or read or hear? Actually, it's, it's, it's both. Okay. Rappler is a combination of three overlapping circles. And, you know, the first part is the professional journalist. The second part is what we're calling the wisdom of crowds. We didn't mm -hmm. make up that word. You know, it's um, citizen journalists, mm -hmm. anyone who is part of us, because this is a very participatory environment. It's no longer us alone. We're no longer the gatekeepers. And then the last overlapping circle is technology, mm -hmm. rich media that people can play with and, and actually act. Okay. So for the first time, journalists, traditional journalists have been taught. I've, it's been drilled into me. You step back, you tell the story, but you never get involved. Okay. But that's not really the way things work in the real world. You know, when you're there, you see someone killed in front of you. It has an impact on you. That's right. And you want to do something about it. So you, in the past, you funnel all of that into telling a story. Mm -hmm. But now we can do more. We can not just stop with telling the story. We can actually help move up the value chain and give direction to people who want to do something about it. Okay. 
And um, if I'm not mistaken, you haven't officially launched. Not yet. But you've gotten <laughs> a wave of positive feedback already. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, um, the effective reach of Rappler.com has now surpassed those. So you were talking about traditional journalism or traditional journalists. It now has actually surpassed the effective reach of this traditional uh, journalism channels. What's your take on that? I was surprised, pleasantly so, and I think part of the reason is that we push the envelope. I mean, there are certain things in our society that uh, people don't touch. You know, corruption is one. It's hard to touch it because we're so interlocked mm -hmm. together. When you do that story, you have to have courage. And um, I have to say, the women and the men of Rappler <laughs> tend to have too much courage. Um, <laughs> so we had both positive and negative okay, attention. Yeah. And that's part of what fueled that effective reach. You know, uh, before we were even launched, I, mean, I knew I was back in the Philippines when the first day of the new year, um, we were questioned, you know, what is online journalism? Mm -hmm. Why should we respond to online journalism mm -hmm. by, uh, by UST? So I, 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 we responded. We just said, you know, well, this is online journalism. Okay. So you're, you're leading this charge. Now, where do you hope to take it? Really, I hope that it becomes a force for positive change. I mean, okay. that's the, the main mission of Rappler. I also think that it, if we can harness it properly, we can actually help shape democracy in the way it's supposed to be. In our society, if we're in the same room together and you are the president of the country, our culture almost teaches us not to challenge. Um, journalists do all the time, but there's certain cultural norms. I mean, I felt it when I worked in a Filipino company. People wouldn't challenge things I said because I'm their boss. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, it's I not in our about nature. This just recently, about the the. The dynamic index. Well, I did the, yeah. power the power index. distance index. You know, we right. are the fourth uh, highest globally in terms of our respect for authority, that's right. and that's good and bad. It mm -hmm. just means we don't challenge authority, that's and right. even if authority is wrong. Mm -hmm. So what social media has done, and I think what the internet has done, is is it's helping change these values because all of a sudden, people are their own broadcasting platform. They speak their minds in mm -hmm. a way that they may never have before if it was a face-to-face. -face. Our culture has taught us not to do that. So this is a way to help change values, hopefully for the positive. It's a way to encourage greater transparency. It's also chaotic. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a lot of voices demanding, and not everyone has the same level of knowledge, but that's part of this education can happen in a in a transparent manner. Mm -hmm. um, I've read a couple of your articles on Rappler.com. Thank you. And they do have a different tone. Um, it's, a, it's more personal, how you write it. Um, is that deliberate? Yes, absolutely. Um, studies all around the world have shown us that the age of authority is dead. The age of authenticity is in. Um, what does that mean? I think it, uh, for us it means that, look, when I used to be CNN, I never had to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You speak with the voice of authority. And if CNN said that it wasn't a story, it wasn't a story for CNN. There was no other way to get information out before with traditional gatekeepers. Um, as ABS-CBN, for a while while I was head of ABS-CBN News, you know, we, the traditional gatekeeping was still there. Mm -hmm. But I watched it dissolve completely. Mm -hmm. I watched the gates come crashing down. Because now, globally, Twitter breaks the news before traditional news exactly. groups. And the gatekeeping functions of traditional media are gone. Mm -hmm. So let's not pretend it's there. Let's not pretend that we know more than the people who live in those communities because they know more than we do. So what we're trying to do in Rappler is we're, we're trying to be as real as we can. And it's actually hard mm -hmm. because when you do that, you bring down your walls and you become vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You are like every... Every, it's an equalizer. This is a great equalizer. It's a great leveler. It is. And you're just coming at it with different experiences. So we're trying to write it as, like for me, I am who I am. I've had the experiences I've had. I write with that voice. Okay. And you expect to be challenged. That's another difference. So um, talking about gatekeeping and the walls coming down, surely from your background as a traditional journalist, um, Internally, though, how do, or personally, how do you think about policing yourself 
I mean, do you really let it all out there or there are still certain standards that you need to follow and so on and so forth? It's really hard because you're defining it every moment. Okay. Social media is 24-7. That's right. I mean, we used to say cable news is 24-7. Good God, this world is different. Um, it's on all the time. Uh, it's more emotional. People are much more... Negative comments are easier to come, you know, to write exactly. on Twitter or on Facebook. Um, how do we? I think the discipline of traditional media really helps. Uh, and I have two rules, and this is something that we've said all the time to our guys and and at FEU when we had our Move Manila um, chat series yesterday. Um, first is I, I think it's simple: do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Okay. You know, that's a good rule of thumb as a person. It's a great rule of thumb for social media. And then the second is, I would never write or say anything, even if it's just my opinion. I would never write or say anything that I would not say at a dinner. Okay. You know, I think that... So that's your guiding... Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like before you were talking to a stage and the stage could never touch you. Now, look how much more intimate it is. We're at a dinner table and there are only three of us there. <laughs> you know, that's kind of my, my gauge now is that um, people on social media, people on Twitter, mm -hmm. I know people on Twitter and they're my friends even though I've never met them in real life. Mm -hmm. um, three of the people we hired for Rappler, we met on Twitter, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and it, it moves. One of the things that I love is that this virtual world is actually shaking the real world. And we can act and work together much faster, much quicker, much cheaper in the virtual world in a way to affect the real world. Okay. Um, there has been a lot of talk and debate about bloggers. Of course, Twitter is micro-blogging. Yes. And there's a lot of talk about uh, the, the, the line between blogging and journalism. Sure. What's your opinion on that? There is a line. You know, uh, traditional journalism requires a discipline. Um, you are committed to certain things. You know that you will not charge anyone or accuse anyone of anything without getting their side. Mm -hmm. You're not a journalist if you, if you do. Um, you know that you have to be ethical. You have to be balanced. You have to be fair. Those are, everyone knows what journalism is supposed to do. Bloggers have a certain freedom that traditional journalists don't have. Okay. And they are changing traditional journalists in the same way that the existence of traditional journalism is helping disciplined bloggers. You know, in, in the end, I think that people are looking for information they can trust. Okay. It's still credibility. Mm -hmm. And a blogger gets people to read them or to watch them because they're credible. They know more than other people about it. In Iraq, the, the best information you could get for a period of time was from a blogger, uh, somebody who lived in Iraq, who was living through the war, and was writing about it in a way that traditional journalists were not. Again, th there was a period of time when we had to pretend we didn't feel anything. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not pretend. We had to push that aside. That was part of the discipline. Now that, that's changing. So bloggers are changing professional journalists in the same way that professional journalists are changing bloggers. And mm -hmm. I think for the consumer, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. you know. And, and as the lines blur together, well, look at us. We are actually professional journalists moving into the world of bloggers. Um, I hope that the fusion is good for both of us. And Rappler stands between that the traditional journalism and how blogging is perceived now? We're, we're trying to take the best of both worlds. Okay. If you look at it, what bloggers have taught us is you have to be real. That's right. You know, that's the power of blogging. It's, it's, it's you can feel it. Um, journalism before tried to, to say that it, it will pull out and you not feel anything, mm -hmm. but that's also not true. So it's, it's, a, it's a fusion now. I, I want to take the best of the, the power and the f emotions, the rawness and the passion that bloggers tend to have, mm -hmm. combine it with the discipline of journalism. And I, I, I think that's a, a winning formula. Okay. I, I have to ask this, Maria. Please, please. Um, is Rappler a Philippine news website? Um, well, are, we, are you looking at localizing content or writing in Filipino? I mean, for the other writers or journalists who are more comfortable with Filipino, is this something uh, you're looking at yeah, also? Yeah, absolutely. I think that whatever comes natural, again, it's 
there aren't that many rules. It's funny. We're creating okay. these as it goes. But the, the rule of thumb for us is if it's natural and it's what people want, that's where we go. The crazy thing is if you look at online, though, the websites now, 60 to 70 percent of the traffic is not from the Philippines. That's true, though. It's actually from outside. That's it's right. Filipinos who want information about the Philippines, and they find, you know, I, I'm, I straddle these worlds, but if you're outside, you actually find that the kind of, the, the things we used to do in, in the primetime newscast doesn't give you the news that you want, because you want it with a little more context. Mm -hmm. You want it with perspective. Um, so this is, again, we're, we're bridging worlds, because frankly, it's what I want. I don't want to just know that you know, there's a car crash on the street. I want to know that the car crash is the 30th in the last month, and I want to know what people are doing about it. Um, context and analysis, mm -hmm. those are the things I'm looking for. But to, to answer your question, for me, um, you'll see these changes happening in the next few weeks in Rappler, but it is Filipino, it's regional, it's global. Okay. Uh, so you can actually see that, you know, in the next, by next week, we're going to have something that will tell you. It's kind of like giving you a presidential daily brief. Okay. If you have 10 minutes, these are the top 10 stories you need to look at globally. So you can understand what things, how your business, how you will be affected as a Filipino. Then beyond that, we're on the Philippine stories, where our original content is really largely centered on that. Um, for our thought leaders, we have heads of states who will be um, blogging. Imagine, that's kind of fun, because when I tried to tell them what blogging was, it was kind of funny. <laughs> um, uh, so it, it's, it's trying to create something, given the, something really new, given the technology we have. Okay. On a less uh, serious note, Maria, do you watch Homeland? Yes. By any chance? I love Homeland. Did yes, you enjoy yes, it? Yes, okay. It. So my, my, my question is but from your background in CNN, sure. do you miss the action though? It's been a few years. Hmm. It depends what you're asking for, because I have to say that I <laughs> the action has shifted. Okay. <laughs> you know, okay. it's like with ABS, it I went from being a war zone correspondent mm -hmm. and it's a different thing. And I think what it taught me is that you need to make decisions with clarity of thought because it can save lives or it can kill people like it's those are the things like I, I will forever remember that every decision you make in a war zone is critical because it's the safety of your team it's the safety of people around you um, that I took into ABS-CBN where every decision a month affects first this a thousand people that you manage and the society you serve so the the the, the war zone moved to a different place okay. when I was with ABS-CBN and it was um it was an education. I had a little bit of a culture shock. Um, the power distance index I discovered mm -hmm. because I was learning why is it that we don't challenge authority, you know? And, and when I talked to my guys back then, I used to say, please tell me what you think. If mm -hmm. I'm wrong, tell me if I'm wrong. And, and I found out people weren't telling me when I was wrong. And, I, and then I'd go back to them and say, did you lie to me? You know, why didn't you tell me I was, I was wrong when you knew I was wrong? And, and they'd say, because you remember, so it was, I spent a, a few years really breaking it down, you know, and, and, uh, and trying to build an environment where ideas can be exchanged. Because I think that's the most, that's the most dynamic um, way to actually operate any business from ABS. The next battle now is, the next war zone is starting from scratch, which is really, 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 it's a whole different world. It's, you know, you, you have an, uh, an empty playing field, you have some basic ideas, you pull together the best minds you can find, and boy, I'm thrilled with it. It's, there's so many smart, driven, passionate Filipinos, and I am so glad that I'm working with so many of them, <laughs> you know, uh, for whatever reason, like attracts like right now, and I'm loving the minds that I'm working with, and we keep, you throw something there, and it evolves within 10 minutes into something else that not one of us could have thought about. So, I don't miss it. <laughs> okay, okay. Long-winded answer, no. But, uh, or it has shifted. It's, it's shifted in a different way. It's bigger, it's broader, it feels more visceral to mm -hmm. me. It's more personal in a different way. Um, 
I love the people I work with mm -hmm. because they are driven with the same type of passion and they are smart as heck. You know, they push me, I push them, and it leads us someplace we've never really been before. When you first approached these people with this sales pitch, let's call it a sales pitch, what was the first reaction? Enthusiasm. Okay. I mean, it's, str it's strangely funny, you know, we all... All of a sudden, um, and I'll start with this small group of people who really, they weren't journalists, you know, but because the first thing I thought is, can this be sustainable? Exactly. How can we make this so something that, you know, I'm sorry, charity doesn't sell. Exactly. <laughs> you know? exactly. Um, I think we will deliver a service, and I think people will pay for this service. Okay. Um, how do we do this? So I approached people who had, um, who had created businesses mm -hmm. in the internet world, who, in the real world, people who knew how to make businesses Run, people who knew technology. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a TV person. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that's the experience I come to it with. I'm a news person. And it was fascinating getting all of our ideas together because we really were coming from different places. And I don't think, I've never had that kind of synergy before. Um, because each one, if you think about it, each one of the people we were, t this team we formed, each one was a CEO in their mm -hmm. own way. And they were, com we were talking at the level of ideas. Mm -hmm. So enthusiasm. Then when I approached journalists, people who I'd worked with, it was like, uh, again, I was so, it was shocking how they took to it. Mm -hmm. And the first hires we made, uh, my Glenda Gloria, who worked with me in, in ABS-CBN, who handled ANC, and who started Newsbreak with Marita Svitog. Glenda was my partner in crime when we were starting to put this together. And, and when, we did our, when we had our first hire, all of a sudden, it's like, oh my god, that's someone's professional career. Mm -hmm. They're making a stake with us. And we're staking our professional lives on, on an idea. And as time went on, you realize that everything actually always begins with an idea and as it steamrolls and it becomes a reality it's almost like wow why didn't we do this sooner so that's that's where we are now mm -hmm. we're still at the stage where we're thinking of phase seven or eight and we're implementing phase one going into phase two this weekend okay and uh, when exactly is the official launch and how how has it been so far i mean are mm. you extremely busy already? Are you churning out content as regularly as you want to or is it going to increase in, in the next few days or weeks? You know, again, given our traditional big network backgrounds, um, the first thing we did was, I, I just said workflows. We need okay. to yes. train our guys yes. first, right? So the reporters, um, our team started, we started training really heavily in September. Okay. And then we did it all on Facebook because okay. in the end, you've got to post your content. But I wanted people, we were playing with multimedia, even amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm TV, but a few of our people are print. Mm -hmm. And to do multimedia, you need the disciplines of both. That's and, right. And those are different things. You know, like, for example, something simple. Do you write in the present tense or the past tense? TV writes in the present tense. Print writes in the past tense. So we've actually created our own rules as we merge these different disciplines together. Um, we started with workflows and everyone learning. The learning curve is steep. And what our reporters, these are really young kids who are putting their stake in the ideas that we have, um, throwing in their lot with it. Watching them grow in, the, in four months is incredible because they did in four months what I couldn't do in two or three years with mm -hmm. traditional journalists. So part of it is that. It's like throwing off the shackles of the past because we're coming at it completely free. We're coming at it to create something that is for this audience and this new medium. I've never really done that before. Mm -hmm. The last time I did that was in 1987 with Probe. Okay. When we created Probe, and mm -hmm. Probe wasn't Probe was, you know, a mix of a lot of things that I'd done in the in the U.S. and what Cheche wanted to do. Cheche had worked with ABC News, so Probe was kind of it. You know, it was a, a, mer a um, merging ideas from the West to bring it here. This time around, in my adult life, <laughs> <laughs> there are no ideas in the West that are like this. We actually. We're making a stake on the ideas. Okay. Cheche Lazaro is involved in, in Rappler already. What role she has, does she exactly play now? She's editor at large. Okay. Um, and she's actually, you know, 
one of the voices at the beginning. Again, okay. you need to have, when you're breaking rules, you need to have somebody who's going to say, these are the rules, someone to push against them, and then, some, and then a, a, a really healthy debate to go back and forth. Two people push back against, you know, to try to help set, keep the boundaries there. One is Chai Hofilanya, who mm -hmm. is an Ateneo professor, and she handled the graduate journalism program of Ateneo for mm -hmm. a period of time. I also brought her in to do ethics for ABS-CBN News when I was there. So Chai and Cheche are, we call them, um, the purest. No, no. Uh, will you kill me for that? <laughs> um, but we, they'll hold the line, and they, we really have to convince them. I'll punch through it. Mm -hmm. I want to see how we can we can create something new. So what winds up happening is I'll punch, they'll bend slightly, and then we decide. Okay. You know, Glenda Glenda is also somewhere in the middle. So it's actually a very the young kids are the ones who really like tidal wave. They want to do. Um, someone like Patricia Evangelista mm -hmm. comes at it not as a journalist. She comes at it as, a, as an artist. As an, she's not an activist either. She's she is a journalist. She, but she pretends not to be. Oh. You know? <laughs> so she she's a really fantastic writer. So she'll come across and want to do something, and I'll probably most of the time support her. And then Glenda will be somewhere in the middle saying, "Wait, wait, we only go up to here." And then Checha and Chai will go, "Okay." And then all of us will will fuse it together into something that wasn't there before. And that's how we create our rules. <laughs> okay. So when is the official launch? When can the general public actually expect Rappler.com? Here's the funny thing. The general public is helping create Rappler.com. Um, and it, even this way of doing it is, is also new. In the past, you, you put something out to the public when you've made it the most perfect reincarnation of your ideas, right? I mean... But now, in the world of the digital age, Where in the world of social in perpetual media, perpetual beta. Yeah. Yes, you know you can't. Mm -hmm. we can, and besides, we're built. We're a social news network, so we're built on the platform of social media, which means we can't actually test it until people start sharing it. Mm -hmm. We can't figure out whether what we created will work unless there's enough people to test it. Mm -hmm. So as they're testing it, we're recalibrating it based on their behavior, and we're actually jiggering a lot of things both be behind the scenes and in front on the content side. So um, it's it's a, an evolution with the people. That's why it's wisdom of crowds. Mm -hmm. They're helping us. Um, we hope to actually get to a point where we can have a formal launch, perhaps in February. Okay. But I'm not putting it down to any set date because it it depends, you know, kind of, it's a tipping point approach. It kind of, you know it when you know it. Okay. <laughs> so um, I've noticed um, fairly recently with, with online um, that news gets stale really fast. God, it's Like so you have fast. one issue and then it survives for, if you're lucky, it survives for a day, but then a few days after, it's something new already. Yeah. And I, I come from a generation where that wasn't the case, where it, it would be drawn out. What's your, what's your take on that? The life cycle of a normal news item in the past, when I started, was like three weeks. Then I watched it become two weeks. And then I, I saw, because I was in Asia and the U.S. was here, right? So if there's a big story here, it would normally take a two-week cycle where we'd have it in the news before it reaches the Western world, before it becomes news in CNN. Um, so if I, when I do that, there's that two-week gap normally. And it takes us two weeks to get something from the West and bring it here. Boy, those barriers are down now. Exactly. It's instantaneous. We get it. We we tweet it. It's you know Bin Laden's death. We got it before Obama announced it. Um, so what happens now is you're constantly on the edge. The dangers. The good thing is surely there's a trade off. Oh my lord, right? there really is. But let me tell you the positives, and then I'll tell you the negatives. The okay. positives are that um, it's the cultural barriers are coming down. The information gap is closing, and that's really great. For, it's great for business. Mm -hmm. It's great for, for people who need information. Before, it used to be that if you didn't have the information, you couldn't play. That's right. You know, for our businessmen, that's a big thing. So that's that's gone. Instant instantaneous communications. The negative side is that 
it's much more chaotic as a journalist. Um, most of the time, I, I'm on Twitter, and you know, people have different levels of knowledge, and you are engaged with all of them. So you're qu answering questions from a 16-year-old, you're answering questions from a neurophysicist, and they're all in the same 10-minute cycle. It's hard. You don't know who your audience is anymore. Before, when I was CNN, I am positive that I read every single thing going out through Southeast Asia. Every single one of my countries, you ask me anything that happened in each of those, I've read it, I've watched it. I can't do that anymore. Exactly. It's, there's too much exactly. stuff that's exactly. out there, right? So what do, you, what do you have to do now? You have, there have to be filters. And I think that's why Rappler becomes more important because where do you go to make sense of the chaos that's there in the web? I hope you'll go to Rappler. And this, to me, again, I'm going to, we're taking a tipping point approach, step by step by step. You'll watch it evolve in front of your eyes. The things that you like, please tell us what you like. Please tell us what you don't like, because we will be very reactive. Um, it's something we, we're going to build together. Because uh, I'll say it up front, we do not know what the future will look like. And we really have to, this is now, um, you know, it's a dialogue. Mm -hmm. For better or for worse, it has to be a dialogue. You know. Um, the other negative is that people have ADHD. And what we're going to have to do is, this is what I hope we will do. Part of the reason Newsbreak is there as a site is we will remind people, this is important. Don't let it go. Keep coming back to it. You know, this is an issue that requires our attention. And we know what those issues are. I mean, I've identified some of it. Some of it we will crowdsource reactions to it. Corruption is a longstanding issue that we're going to want to do something about. Um, we're going to write about it. We're going to, to ask people what they want to do about it. Um, Ewan, so I actually think that what we're trying to do is to do the best of both worlds, uh, to harness the t what technology allows you to do, to stir up and harness people's emotions. And hopefully by making them think about the way they feel, they just won't go off angry. If you look at it in the last year, in 2011, we've seen waves of anger and insecurity go through the world, right? The Arab Spring at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a positive for democracy in many ways. People look at it like that. Uh, you know, dictators were taken down. And, and when you're inside Tunisia or Egypt, it's the people who are doing it. But beyond it, when you're outside watching, the kind of support they got on social media spread it from country to country. And you could see that contagion spreading. And it helped actually spiral other movements in other parts of uh, the Arab world. After the, it's still ongoing, right? After that, you watched London mm -hmm. and the riots, mm -hmm. some of which were planned on, on social media, on BlackBerry and, uh, and the, the, the English government. At, at one point, the prime minister said, you know, can we shut it down? And of course, everyone backed off because you can't. And that's part of the challenge today. Can we harness it rather than just allow the negative emotions to push through? And then finally, the last one, which has also hit us here, is that Occupy Wall Street. And what is that? It is our insecurity, our fear, panic to a degree because our livelihoods, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going around the globe. That can be harnessed in a positive way. I'm positive of that. And that's part of the, the point for the mood meter. That mood meter, by asking you to click, if you're angry and you already identify you're angry, all of a sudden, maybe you'll start to think, why am I angry? What can I do about it? Um, by doing that, then we have conversations. Um, so Rappler will automatically ask you how you feel and then ask you what you think. Uh, and I hope that that's the first crowdsourcing thing that's immediate. Then after that, there are lots of examples globally of how you can harness crowds, the wisdom of crowds. In Haiti, in Kenya, it was used to fight violence. Mm -hmm. It was used to, to, to actually try to gain greater security. It was used to fight poverty in other parts of the world. Um, these are things that are possible now. And uh, as we get you know, traction with each step, I hope that we can do more to help. OK. Uh, Maria, obviously, there's now this wave of um, patriotism. Some, some even coined the word patriotourism. Ah. And uh, for, for the sake of our, uh, of our Filipino viewers and our Filipino audience, what made you decide to, to come back home? 
oh my lord. Um, <laughs> I think, I don't know when exactly I made the decision, um, but when I, my family left when martial law was declared in 73, and then I grew up in New Jersey, and I actually didn't know what being Filipino meant. I didn't grow up as a Filipino. I was trying to integrate into American culture. Um, I always wanted to know what being Filipino meant. So when I graduated college, one of the first things I did was I applied for a fellowship. I couldn't afford to come back to the Philippines on my own, and okay. my family didn't. You know, So when I, after I graduated, I got a Fulbright to come here. I was supposed to be here for a year, okay. and I never left. <laughs> I mean, this is Cheche's fault. That's actually, okay. that's what she did for me, and I, I think it's good. <laughs> okay. um, she she, she uh, asked me to stay and help set up probe, okay. and uh, I just never left since then. So my boxes from college are still in my parents' house, and I'm trying to, I think I'm going to bring them back to, back to the Philippines. Or no, I'm going to bring them to the Philippines. After I, I came here, um, it was 1986, and it was an incredible time period. And I remember uh, staying outside, inside Channel 4, and thinking that 20 years from now, we're, the Philippines is going to be incredible. Of course, 20 years from 1986, I was back inside what used to be Channel 4, inside ABS-CBN, and on the day of the 20th anniversary, we had an, ape, an armored personnel carrier outside. It was Proclamation 1017, um, when there was an attempted coup and the government threatened to shut down the networks. I mean, there's, history is a, is a funny thing, and, and the hopes of youth, you know, it just don't happen. They don't come true. So you evolve and you shift to it. Um, sorry, a long-winded answer, but no, no, no. Go ahead. I guess where I left. I left in 1995 during the 10-hour blackouts. CNN at that point um, said, "Go and set up another bureau." And I went to Indonesia. I set up the bureau there. Worked out of Indonesia for another decade, I think. Before I tried to figure out what do I want to do with my life. CNN's breaking news is, I can't say which is worse, 24-7 social media or 24-7 CNN breaking news. <laughs> Both of them are very difficult. Um, I would get calls at 2 in the morning telling me to go to Pakistan. And 2 in the morning, you know, you have to, like, get a visa to go to Pakistan. And somehow we find our way there, and we're there at the airport at 6 in the morning. Life was fascinating. I learned a ton during that time period, but I never felt, I knew Indonesia wasn't home. And when I actually started to deal, grapple with the question of where home is, it also wasn't the States. My family, my parents, my family was in the United States, but it, I never felt a good strong push or pull back. I went back in 2000 to teach. I taught at Princeton for a semester, and that was really my trial balloon. You know, can I go back to the U.S.? Is that where I want to be? Do I want to, will I go back? Should I go back to work in Atlanta? No. <laughs> and uh, so it was only a hop, skip, and a jump. You know, after I realized I didn't want to go back to the States, then it was, so where do I want to go? And I started looking, and uh, that was around the time that Gabby had uh, given me an offer. Mm -hmm. The first offer I turned down, and then he came back a year or two later, and um, I said yes. And... That's when I turned dollars into pesos. Mm -hmm. I literally just, okay, I, I think this is, this is where I want to go. And why? I can't say it's a wave of nationalism. Maybe. Okay. I mean, it wasn't. Because I, I actually think you start, these are very personal reasons first, and then you realize that there's something that you can do with it. You're part of something else. Uh, for me, it was because I realized I learned a ton in CNN. And I had roots here with Probe. I, I was training, Checha moved to Channel 5, and I continued working with her and training the group that she had when she was with Channel 5. And then when, she, when I came back, she shifted to ABS with us. But I felt like where we were in the industry in terms of television news was not where CNN was, and I wanted to help bridge the gap. And if we could bridge the gap, I thought that is something that would be helpful to society. And it gave me a purpose. I think that's it. We look for purpose. And coming home to the Philippines gave me purpose. You know, it was, uh, it felt right inside. Um, it was scary. 
And at the beginning with ABS, I, uh, I was really in culture shock. It felt like now. <laughs> um, you know, the, like you're on quicksand and it's shifting beneath your feet and you're trying to get your stability. The first, the first year, well, it was also a tough first year for me because before I even, I, was, I did a training program for, C, for ABS EBN for six months. And then after that, we did a special separation program. We kind of cleaned house and it was 20% of the news group was, we let go of that. That's tough. I've never done that, you know, and I'm not sure I ever want to do that again. And I, in fact, when Gabby asked me about it, I, I told him, my God, please put, send me back to a war zone. Because it's, it's different. You know, what I did is I sat with the people that we gave the papers to, and you, ne you really realize that every decision you make as the head of a large organization has an impact on people. And, the, and that person, when you're talking to them, has a family. And all of that hits you when you're making those decisions. So it, it taught me a lot about management. It taught me a lot about Filipino culture. Wow. Um, and I'm still, I'm still learning. This group that we have now in Rappler is really a hybrid. Part of it is because some, half of them grew up, they're digital natives. Mm -hmm. So their values are slightly different. Um, and part of it is because we're also kind of a, a mixture of East and West. There are people who were, one girl, Natasha Gutierrez, um, just came back from five years in the United States. She's a Yale graduate. Okay. And instead of staying in the U.S., where she got a very nice job offer for a lot more money than we were paying her, <laughs> she decided to, to throw her lot in with us. You know, And you were thankful for, for minds like this. So maybe that's... When you talk about the wave, maybe it affects Natasha, but for me it was a personal decision where I thought, I just looked at my options. If I go back to the States, I will become a cog in a wheel. I don't really want to, the, the issues in the US don't hit me viscerally. I don't care about them in the same way that I care about uh, the issues here. I guess part of it was that I feel like in the US, you're, you're reporting on a nation that that has systems that are falling apart. And here, we're still in a nation that's trying to build systems. So you can help build these systems if you're here. And actually, I say this to every Filipino who's there, you know, it's like you, you, you double or, and triple your impact when you come home if you've got training. Because it really requires uh, a lot of um, hard work 99% hard work, but it requires that kind of experience that, that, that professionalizes the work that you're doing. So uh, I think you'd know that as well. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's, a good, it's a good technology transfer in a different way. You mentioned, Natasha, are you actually accepting recruits right now? Are you accepting applications? Or uh, what do you say to somebody, a young idealistic person who's digital savvy and so on and so forth? who wants to join Rappler, what do you? There are many levels okay. that you can join Rappler. Um, the first is just ordinary people who, you know, actually Filipinos here and abroad. Okay. Uh, if all you have time, it, it all depends on what you have time for. Okay. If all you have time for is just to read. If you want to be informed, please read, tell us. We will be extremely responsive. Tell us how you feel okay. because you're going to help us create a picture of our world today. Um, that's for the people with the least amount of time. Then, if you want to actually create content, we have move.ph, which is our citizen journalism arm. And you can see there, we, we take blogs. It's a multimedia uh, effort. Mm -hmm. So uh, some people have put, sent blogs. We have photographers who have sent in phenomenal work. Uh, and that's there, and it's a conversation that, that you have. We work together on it. If you want to do more, you can actually become a contributor okay. after that. Beyond being a contributor, if you want to apply for a job, if you want a full-time job, apply for a job. Okay. Um, so if there are different levels of it. By the way, if you have another job and you want to be in move.ph, my dream, <laughs> this is a, a dream. The, the real dream is if you can make everyone really be a journalist. Okay. Because that's what te technology enables, right? The best instance is if we have someone 
in the military, someone in the police, someone in the political parties. Someone who's on the ground. Somebody okay. who is doing yeah. it. Ricky inside a company, mm -hmm. you know, who tells us what it's really like. Okay. That's access that journalists wouldn't have nor would understand. You know, like, um, I'll give you an example, and this is from, from our citizen journalism program in ABS-CBN. Uh, when the Ampatuan massacre happened, the first pictures of that came from a citizen journalist who emailed it to us. And he, I know it's a he because it has to be a soldier because the only people who had access to the site were either the Mangudadatus or soldiers. And the picture that they sent looked like a shaky cell phone picture uh, that was snapped. And there were soldiers, you know, a foreground, the leg of a soldier in the background, another soldier. So it was taken by a soldier. And for me, it showed that this soldier wanted to make sure there was no whitewash. Okay. We stayed in touch with that person. That person never wanted their identity revealed. And I didn't pry and didn't ask, and we assured them of secrecy. Okay. In that period of time, that their lives could depend on that because the Ampatuans were still out. You know, it was very, it was risky and dangerous for a person to have done that. And yet they did it. So it's, what that showed me is that for every Filipino now, we see what's wrong. There are these individual battles of integrity. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. How can we empower them? How, who can they go to? Because most of the time, if you go to traditional authority, if you go report corruption to the police, how do you know that the police is not corrupt? And that they'll, this is part of the danger of bucking the system in the Philippines. You just don't know how far the tentacles go. But if there are people you trust, and journalists, for better or for worse, have occupied that that role now in society. We've seen it in the studies when I was with ABS-CBN. Uh, people are looking for heroes, and you know, journalists aren't heroes, but some of us can be trusted. Um, and that's one of the things we wanna do. We, we will protect the people who come to us with information. It is actually, I think, better than WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. You know who we are, uh, and we give you our promise that if you don't want your identity to come out, it'll be protected. Uh, some of our other citizen journalists ran into trouble, and we helped them. Um, so anyway, the dream really is if every single Filipino just says, this is wrong. If enough of us say this is wrong, we hit a tipping point. That's a simple thing, Diva. Right? Fingers crossed. That's really, that's, that's one of the goals. Maria, people are wondering, do you do, you do this 24-7? How do you unwind? <laughs> what do you do when you don't do this? When you're off the grid or when you're offline? I love watching movies. Okay. But uh, to answer your first question, um, do I do it 24-7? I am very lucky in, because I do news. And news is 24-7. Okay. And, uh, and I love it. You okay. know, I really do. I want to try to understand what's happening and tr try to tell the story. In the end, it's about that. You know, and it's and you always feel very privileged when someone tells you their story because these are their private lives. Today, I I had a conversation with one of the men who helped, who was one of the founders of the Abu Sayyaf. Okay. You know, it's dangerous for him to talk to me. Why did he trust me? I don't know. I hope it's partly because of my track record, mm -hmm. but, you know, he trusted me with his story, which actually is his life. So I hope I do justice to it. Um, I'm, I love it. So I don't mind doing it 24-7, but I also know it's unhealthy to do it 24-7. So how do I do I have, I try, I have great friends. Um, I uh, try to take time off, but in the end, social media, man, it <laughs> comes with you everywhere you go. Tell that it's, to my wife. It's hard. <laughs> How do you? Oh, and there's a reason why we do that because this thing is addictive, Duba. It's you've got elevated does, levels yes, of yes, dopamine yes. when you when you're on it. So, <laughs> and the hard part right now is I'm writing a book. So as before, I, my book deadline. So this is what up. you do in your spare time. You write a book. Unfortunately, <laughs> right now, yes. <laughs> it's, I'm, I almost am, I'm shooting myself right now because I wish I could really enjoy the ad adrenaline of Rappler alone, but. I'm try I feel like I'm not doing a good enough job in Rappler because I'm also divided because I have to finish my book. Uh, I can't wait until the book is done. I, I, and at the same time, I feel like doing that book helped make Rappler what it is. So I, you know, I think that's the story of the world. 
it's the synergy of how you juggle the passions you have. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> okay. So, Maria, some parting words for our audience? Wow. Please invite them to the site. Um, please, if you haven't looked at it, uh, visit www.rappler.com. We're also on Facebook. Like our page, and this way you'll, you can have a conversation with us. More than anything, really, check the mood meter. Check how you feel. Help us create a picture of our world today. Um, it's, this is, I guess, the last thought is that this is just really an incredible time to live in. In some ways, sometimes I wish I was born a little bit later, you know, because, man, the generation after us, your kids, our kids are going to be thinking in different ways. Their brains are being rewired by the technology exactly. they're consuming. Exactly. And so I have no idea how humanity will evolve. But we are seeing it. We are part of it. And we can help shape it. I think it's possible to shape it for the good. You know, I'm always a believer. The glass is half full. And if we are in it and shaping it, I'm Buddhist also, you got to go with the flow. Um, it's, then we, we're more in control. That's the only way to be in control of our world today now is to jump on the bucking bronco and ride it out. Follow the river and let it take you where it goes. Try to steer, but you got to go with the flow. So ah, I guess um, go with us on social media. Uh, Rappler is an experiment. It's an, it's an experiment that we're doing together. We are... We believe in it. We're staking our lives on it. Um, and we hope you like it. So please check it out. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thanks Good for luck. having me. We wish you me. all the success. Thanks. Maria, Re Maria Ressa, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Drinking Digital, and I'm your host, Ricky Baizas. Please do check out rappler.com. That's R-A-P-P-L-E-R.com. And also check out our other podcast at battleaxnetwork.com. I'd like to thank our... Guy, Miguel, the man with the plan, Olfindo. And also check out our other podcasts, Tropical Banter and Good Times with Mo at battleaxnetwork.com. Until the next episode, this has been Drinking Digital, the first and only weekly podcast here in the Philippines about digital communications. Thank you very much for tuning in with us. And the weekend starts in five, four, 